Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to our Good Friday service of meditation on the cross. We must begin at this time because um, the service we we hope to be able to finish in time to get to the uh, the march at twelve o'clock. Um, and so, welcome. Uh, the, as you know, the, this is a, a, a service of meditation on the cross. The cross becomes the central focus. Um, uh, I am not going to be over there sitting at the prayer desk, um, and I'm, I'm going to talk from there. Everybody who's reading and doing whatever they're doing will do so from their seats as we do. Um, and um, there are a few things to say. Uh, you will have received the post-it notes as we've been doing now for a number of years to write a prayer or two or three prayers on those post-it notes. Uh, we also give you a little bit of um, um, blue tack as well uh, to to stick it on the cross because it, it keeps falling off. That's the next one. <laughs> so stick your prayers on the cross later on when we come to that. Uh, the readings are going to be on the screen, but you are free to use your Bibles as you see fit. Um, the, the Bible's there if you want to follow. The readings are quite long readings, but that's what happens when we do this sort of service, because it's a meditation on the cross. So the readings, the focus on the cross, are quite long. Um, and so they're broken up with different voices, but as I said, they're on that you can get a Bible if you want to follow along from the back or look at them on the screen. Let's, let's begin with our acclamation and our prayer at the, uh, on, on, on your service sheets. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Lord Jesus, on this Good Friday, we remember with penitence and gratitude the agony and shame, the darkness and desolation you endured on Calvary for us and for the redemption of mankind. As we meet under the shadow of the cross, we ask you to help us to understand something more of what it costs you, the Holy One, to bear away our sin, that we may love and serve you better, our only mediator and most merciful Redeemer, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and we sing how deep the Father's love for us. Thank you. 
our first reading from Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. The glory of the servant. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? Stand in the middle of the city, our next song is going to be.
seat as we um, listen to the first part of the reading of the Passion from St. John's Gospel, chapter 18. Jesus arrested. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those who you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Marcus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then a detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was, one of, was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Peter had to wait outside the door. The disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty, duty there, and brought him to him. You aren't one of these men's disciples, too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around the fire that they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with the woman himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to, to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple, where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what it is that's wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Aramis sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warning himself. So he asked him, You are not one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I'm not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man in his ear, Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. <coughs> then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was morning. And to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace, 
because they wanted to be able to assay them. So Pilate came out to him and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own rule. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfil what Jesus had said about Pilate that he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus? Asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another place. You are a king, then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. The reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? He told him Pilate. With this, he went out again to the few Jews gathered, gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him! Give us Barabbas! Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. I stand here and sing our next song. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Thank you. 
sing a seat. We're going to listen to the second half of the Passion from John 19. Just to say that we usually do not sing that last verse on Good Friday, which is why I and which is why it's not a wish. From that time on, 
the disciple took her into his home. The death of Jesus. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they sewed a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Now, it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down, but the soldiers therefore the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it was has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies, and he testifies so that he also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture will be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, as another scripture says. They will look on the they will look on the one that they have pierced. The burial of Jesus. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus bought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two wrapped, wrapped them, the two of them wrapped it with spices in strips of linen. This was this was this was in accordance with Jewish burial custom, customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation. And since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Let us stand and sing our next song when I survey the wonders.
1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Later in that same chapter he said, the cross is not only the power of God but the wisdom of God. What in the eyes of human beings seems like weakness is God's strength and what to us looks like foolishness is God's wisdom. Paul again says in Galatians chapter 6, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. As my sisters and brothers, we are here today to reflect, to meditate, to glory in the cross. Of course, on Good Friday is not the only day we are to glory in the cross, we are to glory in the cross at all times, but what does that mean? What does it mean to boast in the cross? Of course, there are a number of things we can refer, reflect on, but I want, us to, 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 I want to draw your attention to a few of those things this morning before we lift the cross up in our community, in our march. The cross clearly was significant for Paul and it was significant for the early Christians. On Good Friday we focus our attention on that significance, the significance of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and what that death means for us. We say that Christ died for us, Christ died for our sins, he died in our place, he took upon himself the penalty for sin that we deserved. The penalty of sin is death, and Jesus bore the penalty of sin, that is death, for us. But what does it mean to have a theology of the cross? Paul calls us to glory and to boast in it. And theology of the cross means to view your life through the accomplishments of Jesus on the cross. Live in accordance with what Jesus has done for you on the cross. Having a cross-shaped theology means to live every day in view of the cross. The death of Jesus Christ should inform all of our decisions and our attitude to God and to the world and to one another in which we so what is the theology of the cross? In fact, what was Jesus' theology of the cross? What did Jesus regard his view of the cross? How did he live his life? The first thing to note is that Jesus knew the seriousness of the cross. He understood the pain and the suffering that comes from embracing the cross. Jesus did not pretend that everything was going to be all right. He had a realistic view of what the cross meant for him. It meant suffering, ridicule, shame, exclusion, and death. Jesus knew that Good Friday was not going to be a good day for him. And yet, he not only embraced the cross, the suffering, the pain, the shame, the ridicule, the death, but he calls us to embrace it as well. He told us that unless we are willing to take up our cross daily and follow him, we cannot be his disciples. We are called to live our lives with a cross-shaped theology. We must live our lives with a cross in view. This means that we must expect what does the cross mean? It means suffering, it means ridicule, it means shame, it means disgrace, it means death. To live a life that is cross-shaped means, therefore, that we must expect suffering, pain, hardship, ridicule, and even death in this life. So the cross is a symbol of all 
that is unpleasant in our world. And Jesus did not only embrace it, he calls us to do the same. We are not called to escape the horridness of this world. Sisters and brothers, we must develop a cross-shaped theology for our lives. The cross symbolizes weakness, vulnerability, suffering, death. Now, of course, no one wants cross in their lives. As to say, Jesus didn't want it either. No one wants suffering, pain, ridicule, shame, disgrace, death. No one wants that. We don't live our lives for that. In fact, we live our lives seeking to avoid such things as much as possible. And yet, Jesus calls us to embrace cross for the sake of the kingdom of God. You know, most Christians have a resurrection theology. And we ought to have a resurrection theology. In fact, Paul tells us that resurrection is crucial to our theology. We must have resurrection central theology. But so must we have a cross central theology. You see, if we only have a theology of the resurrection, then our theology is deficient. If we only have joyful and triumphal faith, we do not have faith that can speak into the brokenness, the tragedies of our life. We need a cross-shaped faith. You cannot get into the resurrection without the cross. We must bear the cross of suffering and death before we can enjoy the resurrection life. We must pass through suffering and death before we can enter into the glory and the bliss and the joy of resurrection. A resurrection theology emphasizes the triumph over sin, sickness, suffering, and death, and that is what our hearts desire. We crave a resurrection theology. To be free from the shame, the disgrace, the pain, the suffering, death. And we are promised sisters and brothers, that one day all these will be eradicated. That one day there will be no more crosses to bear. But that day is not today. Today is a day of the cross. We must begin with the passion before we can get to the glory. We must bear the cross before we can wear the crown. Because we have a deficient theology of the cross, we want to move quickly from Good Friday to Easter Day. We want, we do not want to dwell too much on Good Friday because it is sad. It's about suffering, it's about death, and and we don't like that. We want to move to the joy and the triumph and the glory and the wonder of Easter Day. But we can't get there unless we. Stop here and dwell a little bit on the sadness of this day. The theology of the cross means that at the heart of the redemption of humanity is a suffering Savior. Jesus conquered death through suffering and death. Suffering is therefore redeemed in the suffering of Jesus. Death is destroyed in the death of Jesus. In fact, Jesus calls us to be vulnerable and to suffer, to identify in his suffering for us. And while the suffering of Christ is unique, yet he calls us to participate in his suffering, says Paul, and in his death. We are, we are to take up our cross and follow him. So good Friday, sisters and brothers, represents the suffering and the death of our Lord. Um, just to throw in tomorrow, Holy Saturday, we don't do anything particular, and uh, there's a reason for that, but Holy Saturday in the church is recognized as a day when Jesus is in the tomb, and it's a day of the silence of God. Those times in our lives when God is silent 
and we are not getting any response to our prayers and we feel the abandonment of God as Jesus felt on the cross. And sometimes bearing the cross on Friday sends us into the Saturday of God's silence and feeling of rejection and despair. The way of the cross is a way that we are called to travel with Jesus before we arrive on Sunday. We must carry the cross of suffering and pain and death before we can wear the crown of glory. So we are called to reflect on these two days, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, before we arrive at the trial of Easter, because unless we enter into the suffering and the passion of our Lord, the silence of death, the loss, the emptiness of Holy Saturday brings, and all that that brings, we will not fully appreciate the resurrection, victory, and joy. Of Easter Day. So we cannot skip over these two days as if they don't matter, as if they are a means to get to Sunday. They must be taken in their own right. Throughout Christian history, the cross has become a symbol of suffering, hardship, tribulation. To carry your cross is another way of saying to endure pain, suffering, distress. And just as Christ endured the pain and suffering of the cross for us, we are to identify with him in his pain, in his suffering, when we see our pain and suffering as our small crosses that we bear, then we, our hope will be built on the great cross that Jesus bore for us. So, having a cross-shaped theology means a final point, praying like Jesus. Jesus prayed in the garden, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. I want to say, as Jesus faced the cross, the first thing he thought of doing is to pray. I don't know what you do when you face your cross. But that, sisters and brothers, should be our primary focus. When we face the crosses in our lives, the pain, the suffering, the rejection, the exclusion, whatever it is, where even death, the first, the first port of call is to pray. I mean, if Jesus could do it, sure, so should, so should he. But the second thing I want us to note is what Jesus prayed. Lord, Father, if it is possible, take this cup. Of course, the cup was the cross, the pain, the suffering that he was going to bear. This is our first prayer, sisters and brothers. Lord, Father, take this suffering, take this pain, take this cancer, take this whatever. Distress away from me. That should be our first prayer. Our first prayer is, Lord, remove it. Lord, I don't want to deal with this cross. I don't want to bear this. I want it gone. Now, Jesus didn't pretend that he wants to let you have the cross. Jesus prayed that the cross be taken. But he also prayed. Let me just say this before I get to the second part of the prayer. Because when we pray that particular prayer, we must pray in faith with the assurance that God promises that he will take away the crosses in our lives. One day the cross will be removed and we will have a new life and enjoy the fullness of God's glory forever. But for the moment, you may have to bear the cross. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 that, and, and, and 2 Corinthians 8 that God will give us grace to bear the cross. So we don't bear it at all. But the second part of Jesus' prayer is yet not my will but yours be done. And so in the end, sisters and brothers, we must surrender to his will. And if his will and his purpose means the cross, then so be it. Now I don't want the cross. It's not my will to have the cross. But if it's his 
इसलिए उनको नहीं चाह I'm a surrender to his will. So this is the attitude of Jesus to his cross. And it's the attitude that he's calling us to our crosses as well. You know, somebody once said, Jesus suffered not that we might not suffer, but that when we suffer, we become more like him. We become like him if we suffer. When we suffer. Christ redeemed the suffering through the cross so that in our suffering we have hope. There's a great hymn. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No. There is a cross for everyone. And there's a cross Lord, we, we thank you for your cross. None of us want to bear any of our crosses each day. But Lord, you give us strength in your cross. That we can bear the cross, not because, not because we have power in our strength, in ourselves, but because we trust in what you have done for us. So give us grace, we pray each day, to bear our crosses so that we will rejoice on resurrection. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to have some, some praise now and I'll ask God to listen. Let us pray. Before we pray, to the Lord. The response is, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. For the peace <coughs> of God, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace and welfare of the world, for the witness and work of the church, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our bishops and all ministers of God's word and sacraments, that they may be filled with truth and love, and be found without fault at the Lord's coming. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the leaders of the nations, and for those in authority among us, that they may serve justice and promote the freedom and dignity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who labor in the cost of human liberation and fulfillment, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, the suffering, the sorrowful, and the dying, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from the remedies of hurricane. Earthquake, drought, or flood, and for a just and proper use of God's creation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For ourselves and all who confess the name of Christ, that we may show forth the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us join together in the prayer at the bottom of page 2. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, 
not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as we know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we are going to sing, sing our next song, Such Love, Pure as the White Sea.
for your sake.
Let's say together. Father, hear our prayer and forgive us. Unstop our ears that we may receive the gospel of the cross. Lighten our eyes that we may see your glory in the face of your Son. Penetrate our minds that your truth may make us whole. Illuminate our hearts with your love that we may love one another for Christ's sake. Father, forgive us. Amen. Let's say together the prayer Jesus taught us. O our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so we've now come to the point where we're asking you to have your own prayers, to write your own prayers. You will have received some post-it notes or some post-it stickers on your arm when you came in. Um, you can write as many prayers as you wish, of course, but we ask for at least three. A prayer for yourself, a prayer of thanks, a prayer of gratitude to God, and a prayer for someone else, or even for the world. Um, I, I've put it, some information there on page four. And we are presenting our prayers to the cross. Um, Lord Jesus Christ, by your holy cross, save, deliver, forgive, help, and so on. And, um, and then we ask you to come and bring the cross. We're going we're gonna to sing, we're going to play um, beneath the cross of Jesus and probably the power of the cross. And, um, as well, if we get if we might we both. Um, the power of the cross we can just we can listen to it on YouTube. Um, so yes, that's that's what you're doing now. So write your prayer while we are praying, while we're singing and, and play and the believe in the cross of Jesus. Come and stick you should have some um they call it those blue tap as well because they don't hold the note as you know. So you put the blue tap on there and stick them on the cross. And, uh, and that's your prayer. And what I do later on is I will take those prayers and offer them to God in burning, burning them. I burn them, okay, as a sign of our, of our prayers going up to God. I mix them with incense and burn them. All right, um, so I, I, will, I don't look at them at all, but they're not for me, they, they're for the Lord. Right. It's your personal prayer.
but before we do, uh, just to say, if you do have an offering, put it in the offering plate at the back. And um, during the next song, which is there's a fountain filled with blood, we're going to receive the offering, and, um, and that's we did a little finishing in here. If you want. So let's let's say together the comment. Almighty God, your Son Jesus Christ was lifted high upon the cross, so that he might draw the whole world to himself. Grant that we who glory in his death for our salvation may also glory in his call to take up our cross and follow him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So our final song, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood, and then we'll finish in here and go out for a march at 12 o'clock. So let's stand. If you have an offering, put it in your own plate and you're going to receive it.
our lives. As we offer you this money, may we offer you ourselves this good friend to take up our course and to follow you along the road to eternity. As the Lord bless this money and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we have the final acclamation. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. May Jesus Christ who for our sake became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Keep you and strengthen you now and forever. Amen. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you and all you love today, this Easter season and for all eternity. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ.